second verse, it gets real personal, that second verse. It starts talking about the dying thief rejoiced to see the fountain in his day. And then it says, and there may I, though vile as he, vile as the dying thief. In other words, we're just as wicked and deserving of hell as that thief that was on the cross cursing the Lord. But I saw the cross one day, and because of that, the blood of Jesus washed my sins away, washed all my sins away. I like that part. Let's stand. We'll sing that verse together, and then uh, we'll pray and get on to the rest of the service. But let's sing that verse. The dying thief, when we get to that last part, just drop out. You know what I'm talking about? Third line, I guess it is. All right. Sing it out now. The dying thief rejoiced in the fountain in his day. Though vile as he, may I, though I wash all my sins away. Oh, my sins away. Push it out now. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I. That if you would, Brother Steve, some of them wasn't here Wednesday night. Come down here and testify about what the Lord did for y'all this week. Well, I'd just like to say, first of all, thank God for saving me. Amen. Yeah. And I thank God most of all that it's nothing that we do, it's nothing that we deserve, but it sure is good when God saves your babies. Amen. And I just thank God for what He did the other night. We was coming home from a ball game and and just out of the blue, I, I told him it was kind of funny. I was getting on to him at the ball game because his head just wasn't in it. Come to find out, he was under conviction. Amen. And uh, <laughs> I know on the way home, I kept saying something. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And then finally, he got quiet. And, and there was a song on the radio. He said, "Boy, that's a good Christian song, wasn't it, Dad?" And, and then just a second, he said, Whew. "He said, Dad. He said, I don't know exactly if I died today where I'd go. He said, I don't know if I'd go to Jesus or go to hell." And I said, boy, you can know right now if you want to know. And, and uh, of course, he waited till he got home. He got quiet. And he said, he said, I know what I need to do, Dad. I need to ask Jesus to save me. I said, that's exactly right. And we got home that evening. And my, he was a little bit late. He had a late ball game. My wife had his bath water. And he got out of the bath. And we got, he got into the bed. And Mama, even my wife, she said, see the news. Something was wrong with him. And he couldn't sleep. And he was scared. And then just in a second, he told Mama, she said, well, let me pray with you, son. He started calling on Jesus. Jesus to save him and he, of course he started yelling at me and I got to go in there and lead him exactly where I led Bree at so many years ago by his grace and his mercy and he called out and asked God to forgive him of his sins and then he smiled real big and said let's call the preacher amen and I just thank God for his faith most I'm glad that blood that he shed so many years ago on that cross he said whosoever will call upon him he'll save him and I'm glad for that tonight thank God Brother Steve, he called me and man, I had a spell on the phone. I, at first, I was like, "Oh, that's good, Mason. Praise the Lord!" And uh, that's the best thing ever happened. I'm so glad you said that. When when he got done talking to me, he hung up. Mason hung up on me, and he didn't want to talk anymore. Steve called me back in just a minute, and I said, "Boy, that's good. Tell me how it happened. Tell me what happened." Brother Steve started telling me. And uh, I was actually sitting in the floor helping with some laundry, like I said this morning. And uh, I said, well, let's just pray right now and praise the Lord. Man, when I, when I started that, I, I started crying and rejoicing on the other end. Steve started, and we had a fit, man. And I was crying and snotting, and when, and when I was done praying, I didn't know what else to say to him. I was like, well, amen, brother. Uh, amen. Praise the Lord. I'll talk to you later. I hung up. And uh, Brianna told me later, she said, my dad went crazy when you hung up the phone. Said he was shouting at the house, kind of running around. I said, I said, I got wild in my bedroom all by myself. And just a little bit, uh, Cooper, one of them came by. And I said, hey, guess what? Mason got saved. Cooper said, that's why you was yelling in here a while ago. I said, that's exactly right. And I'm thankful for that. That's, you know, what, what it always does for me is it just reminds me of the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. You know, we're, we're busy. We'd just come out of the youth rally where Brother Steve had been over there every night with us. 
uh, building the sets and working and, you know, and all the time praying, Lord, save every lost person that comes in here. Lord, save every one of these lost teenagers. And Lord, save these people. And, and so the Lord turns right around right after that and saves his own son. And I, I just thought, what a good God we got. What a faithful God. We don't deserve that. We haven't earned that. But it's just the faithfulness of God that he saves our children. We got all these babies in here running around. And you just wait. I, I can't wait for the day that you have them call me. Amen. And hopefully we'll just rejoice on the phone just like I did, Brother Steve. If you ain't a shouter, that's all right. Hand the phone to somebody in the house and we'll shout. And I'll shout with them. Amen. It's good that the blood of Jesus still works in 2015 to wash our sins. Well, let's sing that verse again. We'll drop out just like we did. Let's push it out when we get to that part. Wash all my sins away. How many of you know you're saved in here tonight? Raise your hand. Amen. You ought to be glad that your sins are washed Amen. away. Because if they wasn't, you'd go to hell forever and forever. You said, well, I wasn't too bad. You was bad enough to go to hell, friends. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire. Every one of us are bad enough to go to hell. And I'm thankful I don't have to go. I'm thankful I can't go. Isn't that wonderful? Some people would like for me to go. It just doesn't matter. I can't go because of Jesus. So let's sing that verse again. The dying thief rejoiced to see. The dying Sing it out. yourself wrapped in human flesh and give your life for us on the cross. And, uh, Lord, talking to Brother Mark Secret the other day about his boy and uh, laying there in that coma all these days. And Lord, many have been saved as a result of it and expected to hear that more were saved today. And, uh, Lord, what a statement he made when he said that you watched your son suffer, that the whole world might be saved, that he could surely watch his son suffer for a while for the salvation of a few. And Lord, that is exactly what you did. You watched your son suffer and allowed it to happen so that we might be saved, so that Mason could get saved this week and never have to know the flames of hell. Bless your holy name for that. We thank you for those who are saved in the jail today and made assurance of salvation. Those saved at the youth rally last week and Lord, in the services lately. And we thank you, Lord, that we're saved. I don't deserve salvation, but I sure am thankful of it. I'm appreciative of the grace of God that brought it to me. And I pray that you'd help us rejoice in it a little bit tonight as the choir sings and the youth choir sings in a little bit and Lord in the preaching time challenge our hearts and Lord we love you and thank you for everything thank you for our mothers today now we talked about it a lot this morning we want to mention a little bit more tonight we just appreciate the good moms in our church and in our lives and I pray that you'd bless them help the rest of the service to be pleasing to you now in Jesus name amen you can be seated let the choir sing again
someone around you that good singing. in your hymn book. Find your hymn book. Let's sing 154 and give it your all while we're singing. Appreciate you being in church. I know we had a lot of folks that went out of town and saw their moms and stayed there. Some are still having probably get-togethers and stuff, but we appreciate those of you that have made an effort to come tonight. So hopefully the Lord will speak to you. I believe it's already been sweet to be here, but I believe he has something for us tonight. Let's sing it out on 154. How firm a foundation, 154. So keep that in mind. Uh, plan on being here in time to go on uh, that youth choir trip. And Brother Mike McDaniels has lost a key and goes to his Honda. It's not on a key ring, just one key. If anybody found a key uh, to a Honda, please give that back to Brother Mike. And then uh, let's go ahead and have the ushers come. And while they're coming, um, we've got a couple of buses. If you are a bus driver that are parked out on the grass, uh, could you please move those because when the, the bus is parked out there and it's raining like it is right now it makes big tracks and then it's really a headache to mow uh, so please don't park on the grass and if your bus is on the grass uh, would you please move it and then we do have another uh, prayer request pray for David Smith um, uh, Wendy and Brother Dwayne's daughter Chelsea her, this is her father-in-law and uh, he is in mission with cancer really bad pray for David Smith Children, you get ready. We will take up the change tonight. I wanted to give another praise report. Brother Wayne and Miss Darlene's granddaughter got saved after the service this morning. I believe she's right there. Isn't she? Raise your hand. 
Her name's Peyton, if I got that right. Is that right? And uh, that's the second one. They had another one saved back when Nico got saved. I guess now it's been two or three months. Uh, I got up at the service or two after that and was rejoicing and telling about it. And their other granddaughter heard me telling about that and wanted to talk about it and ended up getting saved as a result of hearing about Nico getting saved. And this morning, uh, she got saved after the service. So we praise the Lord for that. Man, the Lord's good. And uh, we ought to praise Him for it. Let me give you a couple of prayer request. I want you to remember uh, Lynn Blake. They uh, texted me today. Brother Scott did and said that Miss Lynn actually has to have a biopsy tomorrow uh, on a place that they found, which, which obviously then they could be looking for cancer or worried it could be cancer. So we want to pray that it is not that. So ask the Lord to give a good report on that biopsy for Miss Lynn Blake. Maybe some of you ladies can text her uh, here after the service. And then also I mentioned this morning, Brother Parker's got to have surgery on Thursday. And uh, he has uh, had heart conditions and stuff in the past, which makes him a high risk for being put to sleep. And so I want you to be praying hard about that, that the Lord would help him through that. And then also, uh, Brother Roy Lee just told me that uh, Miss Chelsea just left. Her grandmother, who's 85 years old, fell today, and they think might have broke her hip. And she's just literally just getting over the other hip being broken just a few months ago. And so they left the service to go be with them. So pray for her uh, family there, if you would. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Brother Jody, won't you pray? Yes. Amen. All right, kids, go ahead. change and nobody's taking it from you yet tonight. Hold your hand up. what you got come on up brother Nick brother Nick's got a little of an announcement to make here we've been talking about the 24 hours of prayer so he's going to tell you about that while he's coming I need you ladies to listen if you would just for a minute uh, Miss Miranda said we need a couple of ladies one or two ladies that would be willing to uh, do the nursery one Sunday morning service a month they've got uh, enough just about so that you'd only have to do one but she does need a couple of ladies that could volunteer and help with that so one or two ladies that could do each one Sunday morning service per month. Come see Miss Miranda after the service. Evening, church. Boy, God's good, isn't he? And because he's so good, we're going to spend 24 hours praising him. And uh, it's God's not just good because he answers our prayers. God's just good because that's his quality. That's, he's just good. But because he's so good, he answers our prayers. I sat back at the youth rally in the, the media booth, whatever you call it, uh, just crying because God was answering every prayer we prayed. Amen. And we're going to pass around clipboards tonight and have you sign up. They're 15 minute segments instead of 30 minute segments this time. And there's some prayer lists down here, some praising prayer lists. And uh, we want you to sign up. You can sign up for more than one slot because there's numerous slots. We need filled about 97. We need filled 97 time slots. So if you could, God's worthy of our praise. And we, I'm, I'm afraid we, we pray more than we praise. And that's why we're doing this because God's worthy. And he answered every prayer. I sat back there and, and just wept because he did it. 
And I just saw prayer after prayer going to the altar and getting saved and getting right with God. And it's just amazing to see God do all that. And it was God. And He deserves our praise. So if you could sign up for that, uh, it'd be a great blessing. It's Tuesday from 6 to Wednesday at 6, like we did the last one, but 15-minute time segments instead of 30. So sign up, please. Go ahead, fellas. Pass those clipboards if you hadn't already started. And uh, if you don't sign up, just pass it on to the next person. They should end up on the back row there. I wanted to give you some things. What we've done is we've taken the prayer list that we used when we were praying, and we've written out beside each one uh, how the Lord answered it. But we've just written one or two examples. Uh, there are many. Down here, for example, one place says, pastors, youth pastors, and their wives to be encouraged and stirred up. I had multiple people come to me personally and talk about certain parts of the youth rally that was really just for them. And uh, some of you that were there on Saturday night, if I was standing in the pulpit, over here to this left, uh, over at Ridgecrest, was a group that just had their own little revival service over there. They ended up having two get saved in that crowd and two more that really got right with the Lord they, that the, the pastor's wife said they'd been praying for a very long time. But what most of you don't know is that church has been through it this past year. They had a church split less than a year ago, or about a year ago, they had a church split, and the church has just kind of been trying to get through that, particularly the youth group really took a lick. I believe the youth leaders, some of them left in the church split and different things, and uh, one of the adults that was there helping with the young people, he was just weeping. He kept saying, we have needed this for a year. We have needed this for a year. And uh, I praise the Lord for that. That's a big deal. Now, if you were their pastor, uh, you would be thankful that they got help like that. Their church, no doubt, was helped when that group got back. So there's a lot of things like that that we don't necessarily know specifics of that happened in this meeting that we want to be sure and be faithful to pray. Now, if you can do 30 minutes and just sign up for two consecutive slots there. We put it at 15 because if you've never tried to just praise, it's a little harder than you think. Now, obviously, you can praise for more than just a youth rally, but I do want to challenge you not to take this time to ask. I want to challenge you to take the whole 15 minutes. You say, what if I pray over this list and uh, I'm not done with my time? Well, you can pray over it again, or you can take a pen out and you can draw a line at the bottom and you can start writing down the letter A and write down something that starts with letter A about God that's real good. Then you can go to the letter B and you can write the word blessings and just start praising him for his blessings. And then the letter C and you can write, you know, his charity, his, uh, how about Christ? You can praise the Lord for Christ, I would say. The letter D, you could start praising for stuff that has to do with God with all those. And you can just make yourself slow down and thank God for his goodness. And you'd be surprised once you start doing that, the Lord would start helping you. You'd think of some more things. So I want to challenge you to really praise the Lord. Listen, we beg him for stuff all the time that he does. And we do not praise as long as we prayed. We still won't. We had an all-night prayer meeting. Remember that? Uh, we had an all-night prayer meeting for the youth rally. We're not having an all-night praise meeting. Uh, but we thought we could do this to try to show the Lord that we truly are thankful for how he answered our prayers. Brother Cole, won't you go ahead and come up to the piano? And uh, we'll have the youth choir come here in just a second. But I want you to sign up for that. And if you've never done it, it'd be a good growth for some of you. It'd be a good spiritual growth. To sit down and make yourself praise the Lord for 15 minutes. You can praise for your family. You can praise for your salvation, your whole family's salvation. You can praise for this country. You can praise the Lord for the freedoms that we still have. You can praise Him for breath in your lungs. You know, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You can praise Him that you had strength to get up and come to church. If you went to the youth rally, you can praise Him for that. Praise Him you can see, that you can hear, that you can smell, that you can taste, that you can feel. There's a lot of things we can praise the Lord for. Praise Him your car started this morning. And if it didn't, you had another one. Amen. Praise the Lord for His goodness. So let's praise the Lord here. I'm, I'm just thinking now, my family, I want you to pray for my family. We'll be leaving Tuesday to go to New Jersey. Me and Becca and the kids. I think Brianna's going with us as well. And uh, we'll be in revival there at Brother Charlie Clark's church. A camp meeting, tent meeting. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Brother Matt will be preaching here Wednesday night. But if you remember when we was doing all the praying for the youth rally, our services got real sweet in here. That Sunday morning, we worshiped a couple different times. That Wednesday night, before we did the praying Wednesday night, it just got good in here. And uh, I believe uh, it's got a real potential that if we've just spent 24 hours praising the Lord, that it might get good in here on Wednesday night when Brother Matt may preach his head off, praise God. So you be here Wednesday night. Let's get involved in all this praising. All right, let's have the youth choir come and sing a little bit. Come on.
before he went home and uh, ended up getting sick this afternoon, Brother Jason had talked to a couple of them about testifying tonight, particularly about testifying about their moms and praising the Lord for their moms. So I'm going to ask a couple of them to do that. I just want to thank the Lord for saving me and giving me a good family and a good mom. And um, that's there. she's been there for me when I need her and um, just been so helpful and um, and giving me the food and the clothes and shoes. On. And um, so I just want to thank um, the Lord for giving me her. So I just want to thank the Lord for giving me. I just want to thank the Lord for saving me, and I feel like I needed to publicly thank my mom for everything she's ever done for me and my brother and my sister. She was a single mom for almost eight and a half years, and there's not a time I can't remember that we weren't in church, and there's not a time I can remember we didn't have food on our table, plenty of clothes, <laughs> way more clothes than I could ever possibly need in my closet. And um, here we are 12 years later, we're all in church together. And I've thought about this all day, and you know, the preacher talks a lot about you reap what you sow, and your children also reap what you sow. And here today, I'm reaping what my mother's sown, and it's not, it's not bad things, it's, it's all the blessings from the Lord that, that uh, she's helped us have today. And I'll wake up in the mornings at 6.30, and I'll walk through the kitchen, and my mom's sitting there with her cup of coffee reading her Bible. And that'll do something for you in your heart, knowing, knowing that you have a mom that loves the Lord, who wants the best for her kids, and um, seeks the Lord in all times, no matter what. So I just want to thank her for everything that she's done. I just want to thank the Lord for saving me and for all that he's done for me, done for me and just giving me a great mom that's... Um, sacrificed so much just to let me go to the Christian school my whole life and just raising me in church and just for giving me basically everything that I've wanted and just want to thank the Lord. Elijah there, he's getting ready to graduate if all goes well. Aren't you a senior? Aren't you? You're a senior right now, right? Junior? Next year he'll graduate if all goes well. I was trying to get rid of him. And, and when he does, he'll be our first, second generation graduate. His mom graduated several years ago. Sorry, sister. And uh, I remember when she showed up at the school with this little boy in her hand, I said, Sister, what are you doing? She said, I'm putting my boy in here. I want him to go to school where I went to school. And I said, praise the Lord. I'm pretty sure he was the first one to even begin. Certainly, he's going to be the first, second generation to graduate. Isn't that wonderful? That's part of the blessings of faithfulness, church, that we, by the grace of God, was able to keep the school going all these years. Now we're getting to see the Lord bring it in, that second generation. So I praise the Lord for it. Listen while we sing. We haven't sung this song in a long time. Got wonderful words in it. I'm thankful that my Christianity is, is personal. That God so loved the world, but he also loved me personally. Listen while they sing. the stars one and all he knows how much sand is on the shores he sees every sparrow that falls he made the mountains and the seas he's in control of everything of all creatures great and small he knows my name
so good to me. Um, I think when we sing this song, I think of us standing up here the first time we sang it with the rest of the youth choir, and that was about five years ago, and how the words are still true today, and just how he's been so faithful throughout the years, almost five years. He's just sheltered me and given me a good mom, a good family. He's kept me in church, and um, I just want to thank him for all he's done. Don't know what tomorrow may bring. Can't tell you what's in store. I don't know a lot of things. I don't have all the answers to the questions of life. But I know in Him I have believed. He knows my name. on the cross and he says remember me this day and then it says right after that says in paradise that day he stood just like the Lord said he would now what I like about that is that's that's how he got there he got there because Jesus said you know there might have been some that would have come along and said you know a thief didn't say the right words he didn't he didn't pray the Romans road words that we do he didn't he didn't say it right he, he didn't he didn't specifically repent of every sin and all those other things. But you know, it really doesn't matter what anybody thinks. He put his faith in the Lord. He said, Lord. And Jesus received it and said, this day you'll be with me. So it didn't matter if the whole world didn't like it. Because Jesus said he would be there. He was there that very day. And you know, that's the same thing I'm going on. 
I was given his word that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when I was a little boy, I called on the name of the Lord. I asked him to forgive me my sins, and I, I put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, there are some that would say, oh, it can't be that easy. There are some that would say, you were young, and, and your worst sins you have done since then. There is no way that you'll get to go. But you know what? It doesn't really matter what anybody says. One of these days, I'll wake up in heaven, and it won't be because I'm any good. It'll be because the Lord said so. That's a lie. And that you can trust in His Word. You can trust in what He says, and He don't answer to anybody. You understand that? He don't answer to the brethren. He don't answer to uh, the Bible scholars. He answers only to himself. And he said that when I was a little boy, just like just like this week when Mason prayed, the Lord said if Mason would pray and he'd mean it in his little heart, that he'd save him right then and he'd be saved forever. So guess what? He got saved and he's saved forever. Just like the Lord, one of these days, hey, one of these days he'll be in heaven just like the Lord said he would. Isn't that good stuff? Bless his holy name. Listen to this second verse a little bit. Now, get your blessing during the singing. The preaching ain't a blessing kind. You better get it right now. I had nothing to claim But my guilt and my shame Hopelessly lost, I could not find my way glorious light of love shone down on me and his mercy washed all my sins away and what he did for me that day was the price I know he paid and by his grace I too can say forever say Christ, Revelation chapter 3. I know they're praying. That's fine. They can keep praying. Praise the Lord. It's all decently and in order. Good singing by the young people. Amen. Appreciate these good young people. They love Jesus. They're not perfect because they're ours. They got too much of us in them. Amen. They're not perfect, but I believe for the most part this crowd loves Jesus. They believe what they're saying. They mean what they're saying. I praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for it. God is good to us. Brother Charlie tries to tell us every year, Brother Charlie Clark, not to take for granted what we have. What is it that he says? He says, you're not spoiled because you have a lot. He said, you're spoiled if you have a lot. You're not thankful for it. So let's be sure and be thankful for this good group of young people. Just... Remain standing. Let's look at Revelation 3, verse 14. We'll read a couple verses and we'll pray. Then I'll let you be seated. Revelation 3, verse 14. And under the, church, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes salve that thou mayest see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Look at this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You can see from there in verse 20 that the Lord wants to help. He wants to help with the conditions that he sees in the previous verses. He doesn't want to leave a church or an individual in the condition that he described in them previous verses. So he says, I'm standing right outside, right outside the church door, right outside your heart's door. Standing right outside knocking, hoping to come in. There's no handle on the outside. You have to open it from the inside and ask the Lord to come in to help with these needs. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for how good you are. Thank you for your blessings, for the good spirit tonight. Thank you for these young people. I pray that you would uh, help us now in the preaching time. Help us to get settled in. I know that it's already uh, been an hour, and sometimes that's the limit. Some people, we start having these uh, automatic timers go off in our mind, and we go a little crazy. I pray you'd shut those off. And help us to hear from you for a few minutes tonight, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say it. Amen. Let's see if we can get this going here. Brother David, would you get the lights? I need to show you something right here in a minute. I just need to show you something on the screen I believe will help us. So let me fly through the introduction and just get to the thought for tonight. Let me say to begin with tonight that this text is addressed in verse 14 to the church of the Laodiceans. If you read the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, there are, I believe, seven letters to seven churches, I think it is. And uh, the apostle is writing, obviously, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these letters to these seven churches. Now, these were seven literal churches, churches that existed in that day. But they're not just letters to seven churches. They also represent spiritually seven church ages, seven parts, if you will, of church history. And so what you need to understand here is that what we've read about the church of the Laodiceans, that spiritually this church represents our church age. It represents the last day church, if you will, and that's what we live in. We see this in several things. First of all, we see that in the sequential order that it's in. This is the last of the church letters. And so uh, we certainly understand that if it's the last one, it would represent the church that is around in the last days. I believe if you've got any sense at all, you would realize that we live right now in the last days. The turmoil, nothing, if nothing else, the turmoil in the Middle East ought to tell you that things are stirring up for Jesus to come back soon. Things are stirring up for the Antichrist to take control. And so we are in the last days, so this letter is written to the Laodicean church, which represents our church age. So in essence, it's written to us. We can certainly take it and apply it spiritually. Not only do we see that in its sequential order, that it's the last one, but we see it in its state of operations. Look at verse 17, what he says about the church. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with good, you're thinking, well, I'm not rich. Well, hold on just a minute. He's talking to the church here. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Do you know that we live in a day right now, this part of the church age, the churches have more than they've ever had before. You need to realize if you drive around the world and watch on television different things, there are more extravagant church buildings today than there have ever been before. Now, especially when you consider the Catholic Church has always had money and they've always had extravagant buildings, and they still do today. But now what you're seeing is the other denominations are getting in on it, or even the non-denominations are getting in on it, and they're building these big monstrosities that they call churches, and thank the Lord for it. If it's done right, we praise God for it. But here's the problem. Uh, the Lord is saying, I look at you, and you have more than you've ever had before as a church. You have nicer facilities. You have more money. You have more ability to do things. Uh, we have more technology and all that stuff. He said, but the problem is that you think because of that, you don't need anything. Now notice what he said there again. In verse 17, he said, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And so here's what happens. Listen to me now. Because the churches are able to build big buildings, they somehow think the Lord must be okay with everything we do or everything we don't do. And so they equate what they have to mean God's blessing is on us. 
And God is saying right here that you don't know. He said, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He said, in other words, yes, you have the outside, but you're empty on the inside. I don't mean empty of people. He's talking about being empty of his presence and his spirit. And so it's a very good picture of the church age in which we live because it's in sequentially the last one in the order, but also the state of operations is a good picture of what we see. We see that there are people going through a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. They've got more. We've got nicer buildings. Listen, you understand our forefathers would have loved to have padded pews. They would have loved to have had air conditioned. They would love to have had a building like we have here tonight. And they did not have it, nor could they. But see, the Lord's looking down these last days and he's saying, that's not your problem. Your problem in the last days is not a lack of material wealth. I have blessed you in that. Your problem is the other. Is that spiritually you are destitute, empty, blind, naked, and wretched. And so it's a good picture of the last day's church in its sequential order that it's the last one. In its state of operations. And then I want you to see it's also a good picture of us in the Savior's observation in verse 15 and 16. He says, Also I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The Lord says, Another characteristic of this last day church is that you're just going to find a comfort zone. You're just going to get comfortable in your Christianity. You're not going to be fanatical on the right. You're going to stay away from the far, far left. You're just going to try to find some comfort zone in the middle and be lukewarm. And that is a picture of Christianity today. Preacher, don't preach too much on sin and hell and all that like you used to. People just don't want to hear that anymore. Now, they're not maybe all going so far as to say that uh, there's nothing wrong, but even the things that are wrong, they don't want us to talk about them, see. What they want to do is they want to, we just want to focus in on Jesus and love, and we'll all just come together and have warm, fuzzy feelings. Warm. Warm. Not hot. We don't like it hot. We get nervous when it gets hot. We get nervous when they start calling sin. We get nervous when the preacher starts calling out things that we do wrong. We get nervous because that's hot. In these last days, he said it. He said they're not going to want it hot. They don't want it to necessarily be cold. By the way, isn't that a picture? There's, even, there's a lot more religious people right now than maybe there were 10, 15, 20 years ago, but they don't want it hot. So they don't want to be out. They want to go to a church, but they don't want it over here. So where do they want it? They want it right in the middle. They want lukewarm. Lukewarm is what he said. I want to focus in on that tonight for just a minute. The Lord is leveling a pretty serious accusation at the Christians of our generation. It's important to see that when he finds us in this lukewarm condition, he will spew us out of his mouth. Now, that simply means that he will put us away from himself. Now, I'm thankful that he'll never leave you nor forsake you because he lives in my heart. And so I'm not saying that he would put himself away from me or me from himself to the point that I am lost. We cannot be lost again. And he will not leave us. What it is is he creates a distance. It creates a gap in our fellowship with him. Stay with me. I'm laying the groundwork here. When he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth, he said it makes me a little bit sick. And I, I, You know, if you see something that makes you a little bit sick, you might not run away, but you'll turn away. You, you know, you'll be, ah, oh, get, that, get that away from me. You put it away from yourself. And that's what the Lord's saying. He said, this, this upsets me to the point that I have to put a distance between you and myself. The Lord says, you're still my child, and I'm still in your heart, and I won't leave you or abandon you, but our fellowship is going to have a little gap in it right now because of this lukewarm condition. Does everybody understand that? Say amen. It'd be like this. If I had something on me, if I, uh, my wife, she don't love the animals like, like me and the kids like animals. We've got a dog named Chasper that's outlived any other animal we've ever had because many animals have died in our care. That's a bunch of stories, praise God. But Chasper has seemed to have lived through many things. And uh, Chasper lives outside. And you know how dogs are. They get outside. They lay on the same old blanket or something a long time. They start not smelling good. If I go outside and I start petting on Chasper, then you smell your hands and you know they stink. Smell like an old dog, right? Well, Becca don't love old dog smell. I think it's pretty cool, but she don't like it. Now, if I go outside and I'm just rolling around with Chasper, and I mean I get serious with her, and I'm rolling around on her, and she's on me, and I'm rubbing her, and oh, you're a good girl, and I'm one of those. I'm a dog kisser. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. I'll kiss a dog on the head, all that stuff. Now, if I come back in the house, i got nasty on me. Does everybody understand that? A lot of people said, absolutely. Mr. Wagner's saying, oh, yes. Now, if I come in there, I've, I've got nasty on me, and it's stuff that she really doesn't like. Even it's, it, if you got it up to her, it might make her a little bit sick. 
Now, if I come in the house and I got all that on me, she might, if I come close, she's going to say, what is that? And I said, well, I've been out wrestling the dog, kissing on the dog, loving on the dog. And she said, oh, she get, I hate that. I hate that smell. Now, look, if I said this, come on, let's, I want to love on you. I want to get close to you. Now, listen to this. We're still married, and she still loves me. Right. Does everybody understand that? Our, listen, our relationship hasn't changed. The husband-wife relationship is still intact. But our fellowship at that moment has got a gap in it. In other words, if I want to be real close to her, what I'm going to have to do is get rid of this that makes her a little bit sick. Am I right? I'm going to have to go wash it off. I'm going to have to go have a shower. I'm going to have to brush my teeth and gargle and everything else. i got to get all the dog off of me. If I do all of that, and then I say, how about now? Can you sit here beside me? Can I put my arm around you? Can I love on you? Can I get close to you? At that point, she's going to check me out. And if I've got all of that stuff that makes her a little bit sick, if I've got it all gone, now we're not only still in love and still husband and wife, but now our fellowship, that gap has been removed, and I can get close to her again. Amen. See, that's what, people don't want to, uh, that's what people don't want to admit about our God. Because he's long-suffering merciful, and because we believe in eternal security and he'll never kick you out and make you lost again, people don't want to talk about the fact that your fellowship, though, can be hindered. That he is always going to be my father. That's the blood thing, see? You can't change the blood. The blood is on my soul, and it'll be there forever and forever. And it doesn't matter what happens between me and the Lord. I'm still his son. He's still my father, and I'm going to heaven one of these days. But... But some things make him a little bit sick. And if I've got that stuff on my life and I'm keeping it on there and then I come running and say, Lord, I want to get close to you. Lord, I want you to be close to me. I want you to walk me and help me and love me and be good to my family. The Lord would say, son, you're mine and I love you. But there's going to have to be a little distance right now between you and I because there's, there's some stuff that makes me a little bit sick. And you clean that mess up, that's called Repentance. See, repentance is not just when you get saved and you never have to do it again. Now, you never have to repent again for salvation, your relationship, but you do have to regularly repent for your fellowship to stay right. And it's a false doctrine. Listen to me. It is a false doctrine that teaches otherwise than that. And so the Lord says, when I find this lukewarmness, I don't kick you out, but it's almost like the stiff arm. It's like Becca said, no, don't you even think about it till you get that mess off of you. It's the Lord saying, all right, I love you, and I want to be close. By the way, he longs to be close. But when he finds lukewarmness, Brother Charlie, it creates a situation where it says, he says, it makes me a little bit sick, and I have to put you away. I have to put you at a distance. I spew you out of my mouth. Does everybody understand what he means by that now? All right, so if that's the truth, and we understand that's the teaching here, then it ought to concern us. We ought to not want to be lukewarm. We should want to have that close communion with our Heavenly Father. Now, I'm going to give you a very practical look tonight, if all this goes well, uh, and I want you to give me your attention for just a couple more minutes, a very practical way that you can look at this idea of lukewarmness, and hopefully I can explain it to you the way that it is in my mind. Now, let me show you something here. Let me show you this. Bring the lights down just a little bit more. This timeline. I did teach math for many years, so I like numbers. And we've got this line here from 0 to 100%. Now, if we're thinking about hot, cold, and lukewarm, then hot and cold are what we call extremes. Does everybody understand that? Say amen. That's the extremes. That's on the ends. And so what we could say then is if that's the extremes, that we could go right here and say that over here at 0 to 20 would be cold. We'll just put cold at the low number. And, and over here then 80 to 100 would be hot. Is everybody okay with that? Now, God didn't set the number from 0 to 20. Is everybody, all right, I'm using this as an illustration so you don't get to go away and say, wow, in the Bible it says if you're 0 to 20%, you're cold. No, the Bible doesn't say that, but I'm just trying to get you to see something specific. And so if you'll stay with me all the way to the end, I'll bring it down to one very practical thought. So if we're looking at this hot and cold, hot and cold are the extremes. We'll put cold on the left side, 0 to 20. We'll put hot on the right side, 80 to 100. And that'll put the middle as, say it. Lukewarm. That's a big lukewarm. Well, hot and cold are extremes. That would put a big middle right there. Now, now here's another thing you've got to understand about the Christian life, about walking with the Lord. There are several things, several areas of our life 
that helped dictate this fellowship, this closeness with the Lord that we want, that helped dictate, if you will, this spiritual temperature of hot, cold, or lukewarm. Several things. Uh, you, some people will use five basic things, and then I was thinking of a sixth one, and then I thought of a seventh. So I'm going to go with seven, because that's number. That's God's number of completion. So I'm going to go with seven. Let me rattle you off seven areas of your Christian walk. Now stay with me. Number one, obviously Bible reading. The Bible teaches us, and we know, that Bible reading should be something that's in every Christian's life daily. Praise the Lord for Miss Olivia's testimony that she gets up in the morning and when she walks out there, her mom has her coffee. Say amen right there. I know some of you got to have coffee. Can't have Jesus without coffee for some of you, praise God. And she's got her Bible. She's reading her Bible. You know why she's doing that? Somewhere along the way she was taught or she read in the Bible herself that I should read my Bible every day that it'll help me. I was talking with Brother Dwayne the other day. Brother Dwayne, how old were you when you got saved, brother? 36 years old when he got saved, is in the military, already had been in the military many years. Not much of a church background before that, right? Zero church background before that. And so Brother Dwayne went from nothing and living the military life and all that to getting saved and started learning about the Lord. And somewhere along the way, uh, he was in a real Bible church out there in Montana, and he began to read the Bible. The other night after our Wednesday night service, we've been doing those Bible studies, he came up to me and he just was talking about how that, you know, that there were years he never did it, but now that he can't imagine not starting the day with the Bible. And it's become a part of his life. It's become a good habit to start with. It's a belief, it's a principle, but then it becomes a good habit. And he just began to talk about what a blessing that was in his life, that now that is a regular daily part. So Bible reading is something we know that our Bible teaches us we need to do. And if you're not doing that, you ought to do it regularly. But that's not the only one. Prayer is a very special part of our Christian walk. Bible reading and prayer, hand in hand, I mean, and uh, those two things help dictate whether you're hot, cold, or warm. Now, in prayer, I want to make sure I say this because I could have 10 or even more different categories. For example, repentance is part of prayer. Your prayer life cannot just be the things you're asking God to do. If that's the only thing you pray about, then you're missing some parts that you need to help you stay hot for God. Everybody needs to repent. I just talked about that. I think you ought to repent every day. And then not only that, there ought to be praising in your prayer life. Praising is something we all should do. We're commanded to do. You ought to do it in church. You ought to do it at home. Certainly you ought to do it in your prayer life. So Bible reading, prayer, church attendance. Amen. Now, you're here tonight on Sunday night of Mother's Day, so you're a believer in church attendance, and thank the Lord for you. But nonetheless, we got to say it, it is something we believe the Bible teaches that you need in order to stay hot for the Lord with your spiritual walk with God. I just don't think that you can go to church hit and miss and really stay in the hot category for God. You say, why would you say that? Well, because one, the Bible tells us, y'all know the verse, a lot of you do, because it's our Wednesday night verse, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the first reason is it's direct disobedience to the Word of God. So it's kind of hard to stay hot and on fire for God if you're directly disobeying something He said. So Bible reading, prayer, church attendance, Righteous living. Uh, we'll lose some people right here, but we do believe that the Bible teaches us that we are to try and live a kind of life that pleases the Lord. A life that does away with things that displease the Lord. A life that adds in it some things that we know the Lord wants us to have. And we try to live, the Bible said, God said, be holy as I am holy. We can't be perfect, but we should be trying to be like the Lord Jesus. That's old-fashioned, but it's still biblical. That means how you walk, how you talk, how you dress, the things you look at, the things you listen to all those things uh, decide your, your life, your life and whether or not it pleases the Lord. What I'm trying to say is this, uh, you can't just do and say anything you want and then say, yeah, but I'm on fire for God. It doesn't work like that. So the righteous living is part of it. And then witnessing. Now I'll break this up into several different categories. Giving out tracts is witnessing. And maybe you're not a talker. Well, you can still give out tracts. Soul winning, like Brother Jody and Brother Roy and some of these do. That's where you, I mean, you're looking for somebody not just to give a tract to, but to talk to them and try to pin them down about their soul and then tell them what they need to know and lead them to Jesus. And then, But, you know, also just inviting and bringing folks to church. Some people are not as good at just the pure soul winning as some of these others, which we all should try and do it, but they're real good at just bringing people to church church. Well, I mean, that's, that's witnessing. I mean, if you can get them to come to church with you and they can hear the gospel there, then you're being a good witness. So we know the Bible teaches us that we are to be witnesses. Acts 1.8, it says that the Spirit will come on us and ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's what the Lord said. So witnessing is one. Number six, giving. 
That's in the Bible, all right? That's not something preachers made up. It's in the Bible that we should give financially to the work of God. We ought to give tithes. We ought to give offerings. We believe you ought to give to missions regularly. And listen, on top of that, you're supposed to probably find opportunities to give alms. You say, what's that? That's where you're just helping individuals and nobody knows about it. That's a biblical giving as well. By the way, God blesses you for that. Give it, it shall be given unto you. So give him one more, seven of them, and then charity. Charity is doing good for others. That is the acting love of God coming through you. That's where we're getting into our CIA stuff for this year. Where you're finding opportunities to do something good for somebody that needs it in the name of Jesus. And by the way, the Bible commands us to do that. We are told in the Bible that we need to be a person of charity. 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. 1 John 3, 17 and 19 says, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Listen to this. And hereby, listen, hereby that we know that we are of the truth. In other words, it is an evidence of our salvation being real that we have a heart to help people that are in need. All right, these are seven things that we can take the Word of God and show each of us that are supposed to be a part of our daily Christian life. These seven areas, if you will, and there's some more we could throw, and we're going to stop right here. Seven is a good number of the Lord. We're going to stop with that. So these things help determine that spiritual temperature of hot, cold, lukewarm. Is everybody following me so far? All right, so here's what I want to show you. Think about this with me just for a minute. The truth about these seven things is this. Because all of us are different, and we all have different personalities, and we all have different mental makeups and emotional makeups, because of that, certain of these things come easier to different ones than others. We've got some ladies in here that are readers, probably a couple of men too, but we got some ladies that are, I know Miss Kay is an a, a avid reader, reads all the time. Isn't that right, sister? My wife reads all the time. Miss Miranda reads all the time. We've got a lot of folks in here that love to read. Well, then you would think reading is not something that you struggle with, so probably Bible reading is going to be an easy part for them. And to be honest with you, in my life, I've told you before that reading the Bible regularly has always been an easy one for me. I don't know why. I just haven't had much trouble. But then the next one, prayer, is one that I've always struggled with. You say, I don't think you should say that. Well, I didn't say I don't do it. I'm just saying my personality and being wired tight and hyper and all that stuff, it makes prayer more difficult for me than reading. Prayer is i got to slow down and try to not think about everything else and try to focus on the Lord. And through the years, I've learned some habits and some ways uh, to help myself do that. And I've had to work at the prayer part much more than I had to work at the reading part. Once I decided that I needed to read my Bible every day, and once I was taught that I should at least read it through once every year, and I found out how much that took, to be honest with you, it's just been a part of my life. Like Brother Dwayne said, it's just been part of it. I just do it every day by the grace of God. That part comes easy. But because of how I'm geared, but now I remember talking to another man years ago, and he said just the opposite. He said, oh, I'm going to be honest with you, preacher. He said, I struggle reading. He said, I'm not a good reader to begin with. I don't understand. I have a hard time pronouncing some of them Bible words. He said, but I love praying. He said, well, I can get up in the mornings and just pray. He said, I can talk to the Lord, but I struggle that Bible reading. Now, listen, you know what that means? It means we're all like that. Some people don't have problem witnessing. Some people have gotten over uh, their inhibitions and their fears. Some people can talk to anybody and uh, they don't care. They'll talk to my, my mother in law's a good witness. She'll talk to, she gets them guys at the prison and she's got her hand in her mouth and her foot on her chest and she just starts telling them about Jesus, working on her teeth in there. Hard for them to do anything about it when you got all that equipment, right? What was you saying, son? But listen, she'll talk to them about the Lord. Don't bother her a bit. That's part of her personality. If I were to get her up here, which I won't do, there might be a couple more of these that don't come as easy as it does to talk to some of them folks. So how many of you would agree that if you're looking at that list right now, there are some of those things that through your life have been easier to get the victory over or get good at than others? How many of you would agree with that? Raise your hand for sure. That's, that's called being different. We're all different. We're made different. Some things come easier than others. But here's the problem with that. Here's the trap, see? The trap is that we don't get to pick and choose. See, that's the trap. 
What I found out in my life is because reading was so much more easy than prayer, if I listened to a message about getting closer to the Lord or knowing more about the Lord or, or getting more on fire for God, if I heard a preacher preaching about knowing the Lord more and increasing my walk with the Lord, I almost always went away from that and said, yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read a little more because that's my easy one, see. Very seldom in my heart did I jump to my hardest one and say, I'm going to increase that one. No, you always increase the easy one. But what I'm telling you tonight is this lukewarm idea shows us that you don't get to do that. You don't get to pick and choose the one or two or three that come easy and do them super good and not really do the others at all and think you're still over in the hot. Say, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, let me show you. Obviously, if a person does all seven faithfully, they would be over here at the 100%. Does everybody understand that? Now, it's not a math class, but I believe you can follow me on that. If you've got seven categories and you do all seven wonderfully, then you're at the 100% on this chart and you are hot on fire for God. Everybody understand that? Say amen. Now, obviously, again, conversely, if a person does none of them, where are they going to be? They'll be over here at zero, right? If you do all seven, you're at 100. If you do none of seven, you're at zero, you're cold. That's simple enough, isn't it? Well, then what about this? What about this person that, that's decided here in these last days that they're going to be a church person? And let's just go ahead and call it. Let's just go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and just say what I'm thinking. And what if they found one of those churches where they're not going to talk to them about many of them other seven things I mentioned? They're not going to talk to them about righteous living. They're not going to talk to them about certain things. And they're just going to go to one where they can go on Sunday morning and they're just going to be a church attendant. So that means they got one out of seven. Does everybody understand that? How many do they got out of seven? They only got one. They're just going to go to church. And here's what they've done. They've added Christianity to the rest of their life because they just, you know, well, I'm going to die one of these days. Not sure what I believe. I want God in my life. And so I'm going to add a little church to it. Well, let me show you what happens. If you take one out of seven, what you end up with right there is 14%. Where's 14% at? It's still nothing to God. You say nothing? Well, I mean, an effort is obviously an effort. But in this text right here, he's not pleased. Does everybody understand that? Well, but I mean, they're going to church. Yeah, going to church is a good place to start. But listen, if you've been going to church for a while and you hadn't started any of them other six, he's not overly excited about that because there's been no growth. All right, what about this then? I don't believe that's this crowd because we're here on Sunday night of uh, Mother's Day. So this crowd would be more like this. Some of us would be like this. We're good with attendance. We're churchgoers. Say amen if you're a churchgoer. We're good with Bible reading. As I said, it's something we can do. It comes easy to us. We're trying to live a pretty clean moral life. That's three of them. We're faithfully tithing and giving. So we've got four of these things, man. We're doing pretty good. Compared to the world, you're doing exceptional. Not too good at the uh, prayer part. Maybe like I said, you're wound tight. You have, don't have time and all these other excuses. Not too good at that prayer part. and Not too good yet maybe at uh, witnessing uh, or the charity part. Don't know about that doing good deeds yet. Haven't got that nailed down. And not too good at the witnessing yet. I'm still embarrassed, still a little shy. And, but I got four out of seven. Preacher, I got four out of seven. I mean, isn't that, isn't that a pretty good Christian? It sounds like a pretty good Christian. Well, it sounds like it. The only problem is that four out of seven is 57%. What's 57%? Tell me. What does the Lord say? Uh, I got to make a distance here. Now, you're trying, and you're making efforts, and you're still my child, and I still love you, but I can't, listen to this, here it is, but I can't be as close to you as I'd like to, because it just, that lukewarm just bothers me. You say, well, preacher, what about another scenario? Well, let me give you another one. We're running out of time. How about somebody that attends faithfully, prays faithfully, invites others to church all the time? gives more than is required. They give tithes, offerings, missions. They do all that. And regularly looks for and finds people that he or she can show kindness and the love of Christ to. They got that charity thing down. That's five. Preacher, surely five. A five-star Christian, surely, surely they are going to be pleasing to the Lord. By the way, 
They've got those five, but they just don't really read the Bible like they should. They struggle with the pronunciation, don't understand all the words, uh, you know, just don't seem to have time. I get home at night, I'm real tired, I try to read and fall asleep. So I just don't do very good on the Bible reading, but, but I do those others, preacher. I, I attend faithfully, I pray faithfully, I invite others all the time, I give plenty of money, and I regularly look for people that I can help and try to help them. That's five out of seven. I don't do good on the Bible reading, and I think all those personal standards you talk about are just a little bit old-fashioned. I just don't really think God cares if I drink a little. I just don't really think God cares if I listen to wild music, maybe go to a concert every now and then. I just don't know if God really cares how we dress and, you know, if we dress in modest. I just don't know. You just seem a little old-fashioned, so I'm going I'm to let go of that personal righteousness one, that righteous life. I'm going to let that go. But I got these other five. Surely, surely I'm doing pretty good. The problem with that is them other five puts you right here, 72%, which is where? Now, I'm not trying to beat you up. You stay with me and I'll give you some encouragement here in just a second. All I'm trying to show you here is that God cares about all of you. God's not going to look down at me and say, well, I know how I made you. I know you're hyper. I know you're wound tight. I know you have a hard time focusing. So I'm okay if you just are a good reader and never pray. Now, see, you're thinking that's crazy for me to say because I'm the preacher. Well, I got news for you. Them seven things I listed on there are not just listed for preachers. God cares about all of it. Now, doing it this way, though, is not really fair. Doing it this way where it's either all or nothing. For example, I'm either giving you a hundred or a zero on your Bible read. That's really not a true picture of the way most of our lives are. A truer picture would be that we have some percentage on each line. Am I giving you too much math, too much math or everybody follow me right here? A truer picture would be that I ask you about your Bible reading and you give me a number. Well, I'm about 95% on that. I do pretty good on that. I bet you prayer. Well, I mean, I try and pray faithfully as well. And so, and so a, a, a truer picture would be that we go through those seven and we get a percentage, you know, where you could do something like this. Well, how, how are you on your Bible reading? Well, I, I, I read it pretty faithfully, to be honest with you. The last several years, I, I don't think I've missed a day. If I've missed one, maybe two here and there. So I'm going to say 95% on my Bible read. Good on the Bible read. How about your prayer life? What's your prayer life? Well, to be honest with you, since uh, such and such revival, I, I really got talking to a preacher on the phone the other day, a young preacher. He said, Brother Shirley, I've really been working on my prayer life. I'm doing better on some of that. And so maybe you're like me, and maybe you found some ways to write some stuff, and you've got some prayer lists. Uh, Brother Matt and Miss Miranda just gave us a new prayer list so we can pray for our children. And so I've been praying better for our kids, more specifically, a little longer. And so you might say, well, I, I'm doing better. So I'm going to say 85% on my prayer life. So 95 on my Bible reading, 85 on my prayer life. Church attendance, I'm 100%. If the doors are open and I'm not sick, I am there. If I don't have to work and just absolutely deathly ill, I'm 100% church attendance. And now that righteous living preacher, I, I don't know, it sounds a little arrogant to say a very big number, but I'm trying to live for God. I want to do right. When I hear things in the Bible, I see things. I try and live right, but I don't want to be proud. And I know I, I got room for growth, so I'm going to say 70%. Is everybody okay so far? 95% Bible reader, 85% prayer, 100% church attendance, 70% righteous living, witnessing I'm an 80%er preacher. I'm like this crowd over here that goes on the bus route every Saturday. I'm knocking on doors. I go on the growth visitations once a month. I try and do it uh, on my own time. I witness to my family. I invite people to church. I'm going to say I'm an 80% on my witnessing and in my giving. I've been doing it a long time. Had a man tell me recently, for years, for years, start telling me how much. He said, I give this, this, and this. He said, I've been doing it for 20 years, Brother Shirley, been doing it. So he would say he's an 80 85 at least, 85% on the giving. Maybe, maybe I don't do that alms part, that personal giving, but I do all the others, so I'm 85%. But preacher, the one thing I really struggle, nobody's perfect, the one thing I struggle on is that charity. I just have a hard time uh, just sticking my nose out and into somebody else's business and offering to help. I, I don't find a lot of times in life to do good. I need to work on that. So I got a lot of these other ones, 95, 85 on the prayer, 100 on the church attendance, 70% in that righteous living, trying to do better, witnessing about 80, giving 85 to charity, I'm going to say 50. I just, I'm just getting about average at best on that. Now see, if you put all them together, what you get then is you get 81%. Where's 81 at? Everybody say it. Where's 81? That person comes in on fire for God. Now, Cole, come to the piano. Here's what I want you to see tonight. Listen to me. I did all of that to say this one thing. I don't want you to try to figure out where you are on this number. Alright, tonight, I don't want you to leave here and write down them seven things and try to put 95%, 100%. I don't want you to do that, okay? That's what it looked like I wanted you to do, but I don't. 
I don't want you to go do that because to be honest with you, the way I've set up the chart with that much lukewarm in the middle, it's kind of hard to be on fire for God, ain't it? Which, by the way, it might be kind of hard to really be on fire for God in his eyes. You say, then why did you do all this? Just play softly, Brother Cole. Look at me. Here's why I did all this. I did all this because I want you to know that all the parts are important. That's why I did it. I want you young people to know that all the parts, look at me teenagers, all the parts are important to God. The witnessing is as important as the Bible reading and the prayer. It's important. The righteous life is important. See, that's one of the problems I have with some of the mega church movement. It's, as, it's like they've just backed up and they wrote these seven things down and they pulled out two or three and we're going to really emphasize these two or three and we're going to let the rest go and God's going to be pleased. But the problem is, if you take hot and cold and mix it together, what do you get? Lukewarm. And God said, I'm not just going to overlook the fact that the total package is lukewarm because you're really hot in these two areas. Oh, we're just going to love people. We're just going to love. And listen, there is no, obviously it's in the list. We should be looking for opportunities to show the love of Christ to people. I've taken a whole year for our church to focus on doing that better because I don't think we've done it very good in the past. So we're looking to show an active love of Christ. But listen, you can't just take that and make it everything and act like that righteousness don't matter. Not when the Word of God has got it in there. You can't take that and Bible reading and just throw the rest out and act like it's all good because we're really hot on these two. No, no, no. All are important. That's what I want you to see tonight. And then the other reason I did it is I hope that in your heart right now there's one or two that you know you're not good at. I hope that in this message, as we're looking at how many times we ended up in lukewarm, I hope in one of those scenarios you were kind of like, boy, that one sounded like me. I'm pretty good at my reading and my praying, but I'm not too good at that giving part. I don't know how I believe about all that giving. Hey, listen, we can show you in the Bible. We're not just trying to take your money. We're trying to help your judgment seat of Christ. It's a part. You can't throw it out. You can't say, I don't like it. Okay, you can not like it, but if you throw it out, it affects your temperature. And so here's why I did it tonight. I don't expect everybody, I, I'm sure some of you went to sleep. You had flashbacks of being back in school. You was visualizing your old teacher up here, and you fell asleep just like you did in school. I didn't do it so you'd be impressed with any numbers tonight, very simple numbers. I did it because of this. We generally get better at the things we're good at and worse at the things we're bad at. And it keeps going further and further apart. And we think we're okay with God. And God's up there saying, wait a minute, I told you all of it. In my word, I told you all of it. And I'm going to look at the total package. And listen, you're going to want Him close to you. There are going to be times in your life you're going to want Him close. And what you do not want is what Becca was saying to me in the illustration. You don't want Him saying, I love you and you're still my child and I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But this lukewarmness makes me sick and so i got to keep you at a distance. See, because you're going to want Him to be close. We need Him to be close in these last days. And here's what He's saying. I want to be close. I'm standing out here knocking, begging to be close. But you're in there, your big buildings, and you've got this part covered and that part covered, and in your heart you have need of nothing. And the Lord's saying, can you not feel this distance? And so tonight, I, I don't want to discourage you into thinking, because remember, the marks might not be at 0, 20, 80, and 100. Lukewarm might be a little smaller in God's eyes because he's very long-suffering. Does everybody understand that? I made a pretty hard chart tonight. The Lord's very forgiving, very long-suffering. It may be easier in his eyes to be considered hot, but I will say this, but he does care about all seven. And so which one or two do you need to come to the altar tonight and say, Lord, I need to do better on that one. 
Don't come and say, I'm going to turn it up a notch in the one I'm good at. No, not tonight. Tonight, let's stand. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. Who would say, preacher, I've got two in my mind, two that I need to do better on. Would you raise your hand if you had two? Slip it up there. 